Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer today for September 14th, 2021. Glad that you are with me today. Let's go ahead and get started. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. We pray to you, O Lord, you hear us in the morning. At sunrise, we offer our prayer and wait for your answer. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. O Lord our God, we give you thanks that through the gift of our baptism, you have poured out your grace upon us and claimed us as your beloved people. By the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to love and serve you always, and to love and serve one another, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Our readings for today are Psalm 123 and 146, 1 Kings 21, 17 through 29, 1 Corinthians 1, 20 through 31, and Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Listen for God's word to speak to you. Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God, until God has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. God upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked God brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. 1 Kings 21, 17-29 When the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Go down to meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria, he is now in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. You shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? You shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, dogs will also lick up your blood. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. I will bring disaster on you. I will consume you and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. All also concerning Jezebel, the Lord said, The dog shall eat Jezebel within the bounds of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And anyone of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the air shall eat. Indeed, there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Urged on by his wife Jezebel, he acted most abominably in doing and going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord drove out before the Israelites. When Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth over his bare flesh. He fasted 
lay in the sackcloth and went about dejectedly. When the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days I will bring the disaster on his house. From 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 31. Where's the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters, siblings. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. From Matthew four twelve through 17 Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, some great readings for today. We have, uh, you may remember yesterday we talked about um, Ahab had wanted this vineyard that belonged to Naboth, Naboth and had asked for it, but he didn't want to give it up. And so he kind of went home and pouted. And Jezebel, his wife, went and conspired and had him killed. And so now Ahab has taken over this land. Well, when he gets there, he's inspecting this new vineyard of his that he has just uh, acquired. And God says, sends Elijah to confront him and say, you've taken this, right? You've taken this by blood. Because of this, all of these terrible things are going to happen to you. There's not going to be one child of yours that is left alive, whether slave or free, right? Um, The dogs are going to lick up your blood. And Jezebel, you know what? She's going to be eaten by dogs. Anyone who is your descendant is, if they're in the city, they're going to be eaten by dogs. If they're in the country, they're going to be eaten by birds. Therefore, they will not have a decent burial. And Ahab takes him seriously. Ahab pulls off of off his clothes and puts on sackcloth, and he mourns and he fasts. And we are told how terrible Ahab is. He, there's no one, anyone, who is as bad as he has been. He's chased after all of these other gods. He's done all of these terrible things. And yet even he, when he puts on sackcloth, and ashes when he grieves and mourns when he repents. God says to Elijah, 
Look at Ahab. Look at all he has done. Look at how he has repented from his his actions. And God relents. God says, I'm not going to give this punishment during his days, but in the days of his son, then I will give this punishment. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, who relents from punishing, but loves to give righteousness. It's not actually the end of that. But anyways, that's the, that's the character of God. And we see it even with Ahab, this absolute terrible, absolute villain of First Kings, right? There's no question that he is a really, really bad dude. And yet God has grace on him. How interesting is that? Then we have from uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to the believers in Corinth and he is commending them in the gospel. And you know what? The gospel doesn't always make sense. For the Greeks who want sort of rhetoric, who want thing to things to work together with some sort of um, logical path. It doesn't make sense. For the Jewish people who are asking for these signs and these signs that are the ones that they're looking for, not the ones that were actually given, it doesn't make sense. A Messiah, a coming king who would come and die an ignoble death. And by the death of this wrongly accused person, that all of the sins of the world would be forgiven. These things don't make sense. Not logically, not even sort of according to signs and expectations. They just don't make sense. And yet that does not make them not true. So Paul proclaims, he says, you know what, to those who are being saved, to those who God has already chosen, as we as Presbyterians would talk about the elect. It makes sense, but to everyone it doesn't. That's okay, because God uses the foolish things in this world, the weak things in this world, to show God's glory, God's power. If we look over and over again, we see, you know, look at Elijah, this man who's, who's, really actually deeply flawed in many ways. He's running away. He's trying to um, escape his responsibility by just getting somebody else to do it. He uh, runs away and there's, there's this depression and, and all of these different things that he has going against him, and yet he's the one that God has chosen. We saw this with David. While he was a man of, after God's own heart, he still had his foibles and his faults. And we, we are definitely broken. We are definitely imperfect. And yet God chooses to use us. That is really, really amazing. In Matthew's gospel, we have Jesus goes to um, sort of the, the podunk area. He's in Capernaum. And the reason for it is this sort of fulfillment of the words of Isaiah saying from from Naphtali and Zebulun, these these sort of not really important tribes at all, this area that's way out there and and nobody really cares about, that's where God's light is going to come. To those who live in darkness, this light is coming. So Jesus goes and he is beginning his ministry and he is preaching this very simple word or this uh, message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. And I say this a lot, but it's just, it bears repeating that this word repent, we have, um, we have a very particular understanding of what that means. We usually hear it in sort of a, um, a Baptist preacher sense, right? Repent, turn from your wicked ways, all that sort of stuff. And that's part of what that means. But ultimately, this word repent, metanoia, is this turning around. Yes, it can be turning from our evil deeds, but it's also just turning our orientation, changing our focus. Instead of being focused on ourselves, instead of being focused on all the other many sort of 
gods and idols that we have in our world around us to focus on the living God, to focus on Jesus Christ as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, even though it doesn't make sense always. This is what it means to repent, to to change our focus, to change our direction so that God can be at work in and through us. This is the gospel, right? And when we focus on God, even though we're deeply flawed like Ahab, right? We can focus on God. We can change our direction. We can repent from our ways. And God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That is the gospel that we proclaim today and every day. Thanks be to God. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Satisfy us with your love in the morning, and we will live this day in joy and praise. Eternal God, we rejoice this morning in the gift of life, which we have received by your grace and the new life you give in Jesus Christ. Especially we thank you for ministries of compassion, witness, and service. Those who make and grow the things we need. the communities in which we live. Strength and abilities to serve you today. Indications of your love at work in the world. People of God, for what else do we give thanks? We give thanks this day for the grace that God has given us. All the many blessings, providence, and the hurricane. We thank you for all of the workers, for the leaders, for the people who continue to put our community back together again. For the blessings of friends and neighbors, of tree crews and work crews coming in from other places, for volunteers. God of grace, we offer our prayers for the needs of others and commit ourselves to serve them even as you have served us in Jesus Christ. Especially we pray for the church in Africa. The conservation of the soil, water, and air. Those closest to us in this community. Friends and relatives who are far away. all who care for others in body, mind, and spirit. People of God, for what else do we pray? We pray for the family and friends of James Kennedy Jr. who passed away on Friday. We pray for Lori, a sister, to Lee, a friend of ours who's in the hospital with COVID. We pray for members of the church who had some damage in their houses, for the Garlands, for Sandy, for the Wises, for the Frudenthals, for Margaret. We pray for play school teachers who also experienced substantial damage. Brittany, who lost most of her house. Michelle and Sharon. We pray for Gloria, who had three feet of water in her house. 
the Little Farms United Church of Christ, which sustained substantial damage. We also lift up Michelle, a friend of ours who lost her mother, and Erica, a friend of one of my friends, Patrick. With all of these prayers, we continue to lift up all of the many prayers that are on our hearts and our minds. We pray for the 80 residents or former residents of Westminster Tower, which are currently being housed in a play school or in a playground gymnasium on the West Bank. God of our salvation, as the light of morning dawns, heaven and earth sing your praise. Cause us to live and grow in faith so that we may bear good fruit for the glory of your holy realm. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us continue to pray using the words that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Thank you so much for joining me today for daily prayer. Join me tomorrow for some more. Like this video, share it with someone else, click on the subscription and the notification button, as well as going to our website, johncalvinchurch.org, and go to our Facebook page, as well as Instagram, to check out those things. Our liturgy today came from the Book of Common Worship of the Presbyterian Church USA 2018 edition. Our readings came from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Thank you so much for joining. Have a very blessed day, and we'll see you next time. Bye.